So it's 11 o'clock and we'll get started. Um, good morning. My name is Eric Story from the Edmonton Pride Seniors Group. It's May 12th and thank you all for attending the weekly Aging with Pride discussion group for our 2SL GBTQ seniors and allies. Uh, thank you too for our partners uh, SAGE and the Pride Centre of Edmonton. Before I introduce Laura, our speaker for today, I must acknowledge that we are located on Treaty 6 territory and respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our lives. Two housekeeping items. Firstly, must let you know that this session will be recorded for future use on our YouTube channel. If you don't wish your image to be recorded, please close your video feed. Secondly, uh, I'd like to remind you of the code of conduct contained in your Zoom invitation and underscore a couple of points. Um, please respect the speaker by remaining muted during the talk. We will unmute you for the Q&A. Uh, be mindful of time limitations and keep your questions and comments as brief as possible so that everyone can participate. Everyone who wishes to uh, will be given a chance to an opportunity to, to ask a question before individuals who have already spoken will be recognized and please respect the confidentiality of information um, and now with great pleasure I'd like you to like to introduce you to Laura Schultz uh, Laura has been working in the field of elder abuse for about three years uh, with the Sage Senior Safe House and has been working in the with the Seniors Protection Partnership for two years um, she'll be talking about uh, elder abuse and supports for seniors experiencing uh, abuse in Edmonton. Um, thank you, Laura, over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Eric. Yes. So um, I'll kind of lay out what I'm going to be presenting. Uh, I was going to have a PowerPoint, but that's also just not working for me today. So I like more face to face anyways. Um, so first I'll be talking about different types of abuse, um, what they are and how to like how they play out. Then I'll talk about um, who potential abusers can be, um, signs of abuse, why people stay in abusive relationships, how to respond, and then resources that you can access if you or a friend is experiencing abuse. Um, and then I'll make sure that there's time for questions at the end, because I know that it's a very um, confusing topic that sometimes people don't know a lot about. Um, so I want to make sure that I have time to answer any of your questions. Um, and Eric, if you can just let me know if I have a bad internet connection or anything like that. Seems, seems good so far. Oh, good. Perfect. Okay, so we'll get started then. So there's... Oh, I should have counted these, I think seven types of abuse <laughs> that I'm going to be talking about. So first one is emotional abuse, physical, sexual, financial, spiritual, and neglect. So emotional abuse is often played out in the form of yelling, name calling, silent treatment, uh, or gaslighting, or crazy making is another way to call it. Uh, so this is often seen as things like the abusive person will try to pretend that conversations didn't happen, pretend that what they did yesterday didn't happen, um, try to make the person think that there's something wrong with them. And I'd say like, you need help. You're being too emotional. Things like that. For physical abuse, uh, it can be things like hitting, punching, pushing, strangulation throwing things, locking a person out of their house, or medication abuse, which would be uh, over-medicating or refusing to let someone have their medication. Uh, sexual abuse would include things like unwanted sexual acts, rape, threatening to expose a video or details of intimate sexual acts. Financial abuse can, in can include things like stealing money or objects, if a person has a joint bank account, taking money out without consent, using a person's bank card to buy things for themselves without consent. Spiritual abuse 
includes things like separating a person from their spirituality or belittling or putting a person down because of their beliefs or using spirituality to manipulate a person into doing what they want. And then last is neglect, which could include things like not giving medication as directed, not taking a person to necessary medical appointments, denying medical support like home care, or not supplying the basic needs like food, water, cleanliness, and a basic safe living environment. So potential abusers are people in your everyday life. They could be, you know, of course, partners. But then when it comes to elder abuse, then we often see that it's people like children, grandchildren, nieces and nephews, sometimes siblings, sometimes it can be roommates. Sometimes we've seen even landlords that become abusive. So it's really, you know, complicates things, especially when you think about your own child or grandchild, niece or nephew that's abusing you, right? Um, so next I'll talk about some signs of abuse, some ways that you might be able to see it recognize it in a person. So a person who's being abused might be withdrawn or be less interested in personal relationships, especially if they normally were really close with you and then now they just don't wanna to get together, don't wanna do things. Of course, this could be signs of other things too, but it is a sign to maybe ask about, right? They also might be suddenly uninterested in things that they normally were interested in. Uh, they might usually, you know, come to this group, for instance, and now they're like, no, I can't. And they don't explain why. Uh, they might start asking to borrow money from you or be unable to pay bills. Ooh, I have unstable internet connection. Can you guys still hear me okay? Yeah, seems sweet. Okay, that's good. <laughs> um, another sign might be also bruises or broken bones or other injuries, um, which can also be a sign of other things, but worthwhile to ask about. Uh, they may also have dirty clothes or be unkempt, like their hair isn't done nice. If this is unusual for them, it's worth checking in about. Um, or... I think one of the biggest signs is if all of a the sudden they have a relative partner or friend move in with them, or if they move in with a relative partner or friend, um, and then you see these changes, it might be a good idea to check in about how that's going for them. Uh, next, we'll talk about why people stay in abusive relationships? Because this is often, it's hard to understand if you haven't experienced it yourself. Because it's like, why put up with being hurt, right? Uh, I think one of the biggest factors why people stay in abuse is love. There's a reason why they're in a relationship with that person. If it's a partner, of course, they fell in love with them for a reason, right? And if it's their child or grandchild or another family member, there's this deeper connection that usually like it can't be broken. So that's a big reason to stay. There's also often fear of police involvement. Um, you know, people don't want to report abuse because then they wonder, are police going to be looking into my own life? Uh, I don't want my son, daughter, my sister, whatever, to get in trouble with police. I don't want to mess up their lives. It also makes things a lot more complicated if you get police involved, right? And getting police involved doesn't necessarily fix the problem either. Um, they also might have a fear of what other people might think in their community. Um, depending on what community they're from, you know, we can also, we can often build up this, well, I have a perfect relationship or like my child is supposed to be the one taking care of me. And if they're not the one taking care of me, then who is, uh, might also be that they've never lived on their own. And that can be really hard to 
face the fact of like, if it's not my child or my partner that I'm living with, then who am I to live with? And that could be really tough. Could also be that they have pets and you don't want to leave your pet alone. It's hard to find places where you can have pets. Uh, might also be that they can't afford to live on their own. Uh, if they're in a roommate situation or a landlord situation, that can be really tough to try and figure out. That person has a lot of power over them, right? Um, and another reason could be that they want access to grandchildren, if that's motivation. Uh, we do see it at the safe house fairly often that a person is hesitant to leave or to seek safety because they don't know how well their grandchildren are going to be taken care of, or they, you know, know that if they aren't in contact with their daughter or son or child, that they won't have access to their grandchildren anymore. And that can be really tough. Uh, and Often in certain cases, especially with domestic violence, where it's the partner that's abusive, it can be more dangerous to leave. Uh, something that we often, or the general public maybe doesn't realize often is that in, a, in an abusive relationship, that abuser has a lot of power over that person. And when they leave, they're taking power back. And the abusive person isn't going to like that they're losing power and so they can actually it can become deadly at that point so it is important to for a person in that situation to think very carefully about how they're going to leave and ways to make sure that it's safe for them so next i'll talk about how you can respond or start to ask about if a person is experiencing abuse. So if you've got a friend or family member that you're starting to kind of wonder about, it's best just to simply ask. Uh, I think a lot of times we're afraid to ask these tough questions because it can feel, it feels kind of icky. You don't want to make that assumption that your friend's in an abusive relationship or like that their child is abusing them. That's it's awful, right? But it's best to just ask, because at very least, even if they deny it, it might be just the first time that they've maybe thought about this and that can still be super helpful. So ways you could ask could be just being like, how are things going at home? And do you feel safe at home? Uh, asking like, hey, I've, I've noticed these things. I just wanted to check if everything's okay. And then the best thing to do is just listen to them completely. Do not tell them that they should leave. They'll let you know if they want to leave and they can ask you for help. Just asking and starting that conversation can show them that you're willing, that you're open to that and you're willing to help them leave if that's what works for them. You can also ask them if they would like support in anything. That kind of opens it up of maybe they just want someone to talk to. Maybe they want... Maybe they want to know if uh, if they can call you if things get worse. Uh, maybe they need some help with other things in the home because of this abusive situation. Also, make sure you keep in touch with that person. If you have suspicion that they might be in an abusive relationship, just try and keep in touch as often as it makes sense. Uh, you want to make sure that you're aware of if things are changing, if things are getting worse, even if they deny it, you know, just try and set up a coffee date more often and call them a little bit more so you can kind of, you know, know where things are at. Don't say anything negative about the abuser. Uh, like we said, like I said earlier, uh, love is a huge factor in why they're in that relationship in the first place. That's their child, their baby, their niece or nephew, their partner. There's a good reason why they're in that relationship. So just don't say anything negative about them. It's okay to let them know that that behavior isn't okay, that they don't deserve to be treated that way, but don't make it about the person. 
also make sure not to blame your person, your friend that's in this relationship. Let them know that it's not their fault. Often when a person is in a relationship like this, they'll find a reason to blame themselves. And part of this is because of the emotional abuse that often goes along with it. If as a child, especially, a person will blame themselves of like, well, I'm the one who raised them, so I made them like this, but let them know that, no, it isn't their fault. Adults are adults, and there's never any reason to make someone feel so belittled to physically hurt a person to take their money. There's never any reason for that. And something I found in my career is abuse just never makes sense. There is no answer as to why a person does it. It just doesn't make sense and it's not right, but it's not the person's fault. The person being abused, that is. <laughs> um, also make sure to thank them for sharing with you. It's really hard to talk about. Um, and this might be the first time that they've thought about it. So even if they're like, no, 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 God, no, absolutely not. And you're just like, okay, well, thanks. I'm just, you know, glad to know I was worried about you. Things like that. Um, it really just sort of opens that up. And then, yeah, they might come back later and be like, oh, you know what? Like now that I think about it, this maybe isn't so good. It's really like the biggest thing I can hammer home is just it's so good to talk to someone about it and let them know that you see them, you see what's going on and that you care about them. So then last, I'm gonna talk about different ways that people can get help here at Edmonton. So I work at the Sage Safe House, which is a shelter here in Edmonton for seniors that are experiencing abuse. So we work with people that are 60 and older with some flexibility in age if people have the needs of a senior. And so we help with the, the people that are needing to leave if they're uh, experiencing homelessness because of the abuse or it's the only way for them to get safety. Uh, but in my role specifically, I also work with people that it maybe doesn't work for them to come into the shelter. Um, so I'm sort of in the middle of two worlds. So I'm part of the Seniors Protection Partnership and part of the Safe House. Um, so I work, yeah, with people that are on our wait list for the Safe House and also, yeah, people that still need support with it, but um, aren't necessarily wanting to move out or come to shelter because it can be a huge, huge thing to come to shelter. You could be leaving all your furniture behind. You might be having to leave your pet with someone else for a bit, having to face different things. So um, easiest thing is like refer someone to Sage if they're a senior and they're experiencing that. Um, I'll make sure that I give out the phone number for the safe house intake line. Um, but there's also other ways that people can get support without needing to go to shelter. So there's myself, I can work with people that want to find safety in other ways. There's also a program through Catholic Social Services. It's called Elder Abuse Resources and Supports. So they've got workers just like myself that work with people to find ways to stay safe, still in the relationship or uh, different ways of leaving. Um, and they also, they offer a class that uh, it's called Relationships with Your Adult Children. Um, so that would be for people who are being abused by a child, grandchild, niece or nephew, things like that. There's also the Elder Abuse uh, Hotline, which is a 24 hour hotline for people uh, experiencing elder abuse that wants someone to talk to or are looking for supports in their area. Because of course, SAGE and YEARS, uh, the elder abuse resource and support, it's all in Edmonton. But if someone's outside of Edmonton, then supports can look a little bit different. 
Um, so I'll make sure to include that hotline as well. Maybe I'll put it in the chat after while we're asking questions. Um, and then there's also, if a person is female identifying, there are women shelters that might be an option. Of course, there are some big, I won't, I won't say big, but there are some issues sometimes with seniors going to a women's shelter um, or, you know, since we're all part of the LGBTQ plus community, trans people may not feel safe at a women's shelter. Uh, some of them are more affirming, but it can still be a scary place, understandably. Um, and they often don't take men, which can complicate things too. And that's not right. So at the Sage shelter, we do take people of all genders. Um, and they were uh, accessible. We have elevators, everything is all on one floor. We have an accessible suite, things like this. There are also two other shelters for seniors in Alberta. One of them is in Red Deer and one of them is in Calgary. Um, just as some side information. <laughs> um, and then I had mentioned before the Seniors Protection Partnership. So we're a partnership here in Edmonton is between SAGE, uh, Catholic Social Services with the EARS program, Community Geriatric Psychiatry, City of Edmonton and Edmonton Police. Uh, so we meet weekly, we get referrals from any of our partners uh, so that and we can look into things. So if you have, let's say a friend or family member that is being abused and you're not able to ask those questions and you have concerns about them, you can report it to the Seniors Protection Partnership and they're able to uh, do an investigation and they can go in. And it doesn't mean that anything's going to happen from that. It can just be that our team will go to a person's house and just, you know, get to see what's going on um, and check that everything's okay. And sometimes the person will be like, nope, everything's fine, get out. Sometimes it is just something else is going on, that there's actually some medical issues going on. Uh, but then sometimes that's actually a person's able to get out finally. Um, so I'll give the number for that. So it's kind of interesting. The If you're reporting abuse for someone else, the number you would call would be for the EARS program with Catholic Social Services. Um, and then they refer to the Seniors Protection Partnership from there. So that's at least a little bit easier. Um, yeah, so that's basically it for my presentation. Um, now I'll go back to you guys and I would like to know if you guys have any questions. Uh, and then I possibly have some questions for you guys if uh, there's extra time too. Thank you so much, uh, Laura. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm going. I'm acting as moderator today, so I'll uh, ask people to put up their hands, like Roy has, uh, if they would like to ask a question, and uh, I'll get to them one after the other after the other. So, Roy, please unmute yourself and uh, let us know what you'd like to ask. Thank you, uh, Laura. Great to hear of this organization. I'm just wondering if you do report and abuse, can it be anonymous? Absolutely. And do you have any uh, connections to organizations within BC? No, we don't actually. Um, yeah, we have connections to the other, uh, there's, well, okay, let me think about this. So there's kind of a few structures. There's um, Alberta Abuse Awareness Council that we're connected with through SAGE. Uh, and then there's also the Canadian Network for Prevention of Elder Abuse, which is all of Canada. So that might include that. I'm not involved in that, but my supervisor is. So I think that would maybe be the only kind of connection we have, but yeah. Thank you. Hmm. Um, if, Larry, I see that Larry. you have a question, if you unmute yourself. I was involved certainly some 
some few years ago with a friend who, uh, uh, the, the details don't matter, but the issue that I wanted to ask you about was in this, in this situation, there was a question of early dementia. And I wondered mm -hmm. how you actually find out what the, the real facts are if you're getting conflicting stories and are concerned that, that there may be mm. uh, that element. Yeah, absolutely. It can be tough because, yeah, when when a person is maybe getting dementia, sometimes they can think that people are stealing from them um, and they can get a little bit paranoid. So it is hard to tell. Um, in that case, it's always good to report. Um, with our Seniors Protection Partnership, we definitely have cases where we go in to investigate and then we find out that it is dementia. And then because we actually were working with community geriatric psychiatry, we have nurses on that team. And so then we're actually able to assess for that and then get them those kind of support. So it's never a bad idea to report it. Never hurts. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mary, mm -hmm. I see you. Mary's got her hand up. Can you unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Hi, Laura. Yeah. <laughs> um, great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. I, I was curious about um, any sort of rural outreach and supports and what does that look like for SAGE? You know, if, if there's any sort of, uh, I guess, system where there is transportation or any sort of in-community stuff that you're aware of? Mm. Mm, so do you mean like, so if someone's outside of Edmonton? Yeah, sorry. Like, mm. so if they're in a rural community in, um, yeah, just surrounding areas and mm. if there's some sort of, you know, disclosure of abuse, like how, how does that look for the SAGE team or mm -hmm. kind of the same thing? Uh, it's, yeah, I'm like, we definitely, if someone is wanting to come to Edmonton and needing mm -hmm. support, um, us at the safe house will definitely work with them and figure out ways for support. So what we can do if it's a transportation issue of getting them there mm -hmm. is there's like a few options. We can go through Alberta, uh, supports and they can provide transportation for someone to leave abuse. Um, so that's one thing we can do. Uh, sometimes we'll look at, you know, is there someone else that's safe that can figure it out or we'll do some safety planning, but yeah, we have certainly had people come from sometimes like left bridge or, um, uh, it was like a red deer, different places. I think we've even had like one or two people that are like, I'm coming from BC and like, I want to settle in Edmonton cause I've got some family here, but I've just, you know, so those kind of things like we'll definitely make it work. Um, we're not opposed to bringing someone in. Um, and yeah, we try and figure out transportation often options, however it is. And yeah, if it needs to be, if it's a more expensive ride, then we go through Alberta supports and they can help make that work. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you, Laura. Mm -hmm. um, that actually reminds me, I should maybe touch on um, when a person is leaving abuse, they're actually eligible for different kinds of supports. Um, through Alberta Supports, they have what's called a fleeing abuse benefit uh, that anyone who's experienced abuse is able to apply for. Um, and usually we find with seniors because seniors are on a fixed income, um, unless they're somehow working and stuff, like usually people are able to get that and that helps cover the cost of the damage deposit and first month's rent and a little bit of furniture uptake. Uh, it's not much, it's like a thousand and twenty dollars. Um, but yeah, there's that. And then there's some different programs in Edmonton to get furniture and things like that. So, you know, if that's a, something that's holding someone back, there are those options as well. Jen, you have a question. Uh, great presentation, Laura. Um, I was wondering if you noticed any uh, patterns, um, you know, if there's more um, elder abuse, uh, is it mostly women? Is it a culture thing? Is it poverty? Um, is it a, a race thing? Is, there, is it more common in, in certain cultures? I just wondered. 
Good question. And it's hard to answer. So unfortunately, there is very, very little research done in elder abuse. Uh, the research in abuse is all focused on domestic violence. Um, and of course, there's different factors in elder abuse. Generally, if we're just going based on what we have in our shelter, uh, the safe house, uh, it is mostly women. Um, and it's mostly children that are the abusers. Uh, culturally, I mean, we mainly serve white people just, and I think that's mainly because we have the language barrier and the cultural barrier. And there's a lot more fear of, you know, if you're from a different culture, if you'll be able to get the food that you like, things like that. So we are working to try and expand ourselves as much as possible so that we can get to those seniors that don't know about us. Um, so we actually have a new uh, kind of program that we're working with. We're working with the South Asian community uh, to, so we hired someone specifically from the Southeast Asian community that speaks uh, four or five of those languages so that uh, He's yeah, trying to get into the community and get people aware of us and figure out what abuse looks like within that community. Because that's something that we're learning through this project is that abuse looks very different when you've got different cultural expectations. Um, so yeah, we're figuring out different ways to do that. Um, and anytime we have a senior in from a different culture or country, uh, we try to work with them and figure out, okay, what food would you like? And we can get that. Where can we get that food? Um, and what kind of factors are going on with you that's different? Uh, but yeah, at this point, generally it's um, white and First Nations people that are mainly coming in. And that's probably just because of, uh, yeah, lack, lacking on our part. Um, Eric, if you don't mind, I had one more question. Go ahead. Go um, ahead. Laura, that's, you just made me think there. And how do people hear about you? And, and how do people, uh, how do you reach isolated seniors? Like, like do you have special tricks to, to get your message out there? Yeah, it's, uh, it's certainly tough. And so, um, World Elder Abuse Awareness Day is on June 15th. That's usually our big campaign. We have a bunch of flyers that we send out and we try to make ourselves visible, uh, you know, through Sage, like, you know, in our Sage directory, we have information about the safe house and World Elder Abuse Awareness Days and senior centers, uh, different senior serving buildings, things like this, doing presentations like this. Mm -hmm. um, with the Seniors Protection Partnership, our City of Edmonton social worker, actually, mainly her job is to try and reach out to these communities and make it known that, like, you don't have to stay like this and you can get support, things like that. So it's definitely, uh, yeah, something we're working on of, yeah, how do we reach people? And yeah, especially if they're isolated, it's very tough if they don't have access to a phone and I think that's one of the biggest problems we've had during the pandemic. It was like March, 2020, we were like busy all the time. And then we suddenly dropped off and we had no cases. And most of the pandemic, we so we have seven suites in our shelter that we can take people in. And during the pandemic, we always had at least two or three open. Now we're starting to fill up again, but uh, yeah, that's definitely been a huge concern. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Seeing as I'm the moderator, I decided to follow my own rules and put my hand up. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for the presentation, Laura. One of the things that you mentioned was shame. And when I was doing social work with seniors, I'd have a senior come into, into the office and start, you know, say, I'm so embarrassed. I don't know who to talk to. And then I knew instantly they were in a scam. They might be a couple mm -hmm. of years behind in filing their taxes, or they might be experiencing abuse. And it's always so hard. I mean, 
I try all the time when I'm talking to people to try to say, whatever you're doing, it's okay. <laughs> you know, we're not going to judge mm-hmm. you. Uh, but like people who, you know, again, uh, why am I staying, you know, why am I staying with this person and that sort of thing? Fortunately, I had Michelle's number, uh, Michelle, uh, the coordinator yeah, for Michelle the, Markham, yeah, yeah, for the safe. I had her on speed dial, so fortunately, I could transfer it over. But that whole idea of um, trying to comfort when when that first conversation happens trying to comfort somebody and saying listen um please don't be ashamed please let's let's be able to have an open and honest talk about this how do you how do you do that yeah it's it's tough like i think uh ways that i found that can be helpful is to uh listen and to let there be silence often giving some space for there to be some silence gives people that space and time to gather their thoughts and talk more. Um, And also thanking them for talking to you about anything that they share, letting them know that like, this is a privilege that you're sharing this information with me. I realize that and thank you for trusting me. Uh, and I think also letting them know that they're not alone in this, um, I'll often try and like, I mean, I have the advantage of that. I work with lots of people in this. And so then I'll talk about like, you know, I have someone that's been in a similar situation to you and this is what they described to me that they felt like that they felt completely isolated, that they were once educated and really smart and had their lives together. And then things just got foggy when they were in this relationship and it, nothing made sense anymore. And that's absolutely okay. And then if they're like, Oh my gosh, like other people feel that too. And it's like, yeah, abuse doesn't make sense. It just doesn't. Mm -hmm. Um, Do we have any other questions? Or actually, you said you had some questions for us. So uh, if you'd like to pose those, Laura, put up your hand. Uh, Absolutely. (laughs) Sorry, (laughs) just kidding. Right. (laughs) Yeah, so uh, as I had mentioned, uh, we're trying to uh, open ourselves up and make sure that we're uh, as able to serve, like, as best able to serve people as we can. Uh, So I've noticed that we haven't had a lot of LGBTQ plus seniors coming into our shelter. There's, you know, the occasional kind of thing. Uh, But I know that abuse happens within the community too. So, Um, I myself am part of the community, but I'm of younger generation, so it's kind of different for me. So I wanted to uh, see if anyone's willing to share uh, ideas or ways that uh, we could make our shelter seem more safe, uh, ways that we can approach when we're talking with people to let them know that uh, they can come out to us if they want. Yeah, I want to see if you guys have any... uh, advice for myself and for our shelter just pending anybody sticking up their hand i know that that sort of the lifelong um fear of being exposed as being gay or lesbian or trans that that can hamper uh, a lot of it is i'm just going to be shamed again so uh, Mm. i do think that for us, all of us as community members, it's it's really important to when we're talking to friends or have an opportunity to talk to a group of people to just say that, you know, Sage is a safe place, um, mm-hmm. that they are understanding, they are caring. And that's I think that is the, the biggest thing that we can do. You know the the old adage that best advertising is word of mouth, mm. um, and so I think that you know you identifying as a member of the community. When I 
but did social work at Sage and I was out as a gay man, you know, I think that automatically funneled clients <laughs> to, my, mm -hmm. to my desk. But uh, that's, those are just some of the thoughts. Larry, I see you uh, had stuck your hand up there. I'm going to say two things that are, are cliched essentially, but I think they are important. One of which is sometimes the messenger is as important as the message. And Eric really has just mm -hmm. made that point. Uh, mm -hmm. Particularly our generation tends not to be trusting unless someone gives us a clear, very clear signal that it's, a, it's safe. The mm -hmm. other thing is, you know, even a place like Sage or a doctor's office or whatever, that they can be threatening uh, to, uh, to people and going out and uh, talking to GLBT groups, meeting people where they are, I think can be enormously helpful. Um, mm -hmm. Absolutely, thank you, Larry. Uh, Roy, I see you have your hand up. I don't know whether you do this already, but um, with the, the communication that comes out from the Pride Center, uh, whether you advertise in that or at least make mention of the availability of this organization and the contact information, because I think that that's probably a tool that could be used. I don't know how many seniors are, are involved in, in reading that material, but at least it's out there. It probably doesn't cost anything. And, and word of mouth is, is all often a, a great resource. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Jan, go ahead. Um, I, I would just like to mention that there's a lot of power in the rainbow uh, sticker. Mm. You know, if people post that on their windows in their offices and stuff, it's just carried around everywhere. Yeah, yeah. It just uh, it's just is it's like a, a message that you're safe here, and it's it's um, I think a really good tool. I, I think in terms of Thank you, uh, sending that message. I, over the reception desk at Sage, there's a sign that says welcome in about 50 or 60 different languages. And the exclamation after welcome is a rainbow uh, exclamation part, you know, like a rainbow triangle exclamation point after welcome. So um, yeah, I think that, you know, I know Sage has done a lot of work on that in terms of trying to ensure that the offices have a safe feeling. It, doesn't matter it's still an office you know that always that challenge but um does anybody i'm conscious of me talking all the time uh, mary you have uh, your hand up again yeah i was i was just thinking too um that just ensuring that i guess that ongoing and consistent training with um, healthcare providers and staff is so important as we know and i think that a piece of that training or education, a, a big piece of it is even explaining the historical context as to why um, older adults specifically in the community have mistrust for these systems and for healthcare providers um, for various reasons. And then also, as mentioned already, like that fear of having, you know, to go back in the closet, right, just to self uh, preserve and to make sure you're not outing yourself because it doesn't feel safe. So I think even like what is in the physical environment can make such a big difference for us too, right? Like what could like the rainbow, right? But are we doing the things as healthcare providers and support people to ensure that we are in fact safer, right? We could have the rainbow up, but what are we doing like around mm -hmm. our policies and, um, and ongoing training and support for staff, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, thank, thank you, Mary. Mary. Um, just that one, one of the points that Roy mentioned, um, you know, possibly if, if Sage were to put an ad in, you know, the pride, 
uh, material that's going out. Again, a lot of the Pride Center does tend to focus to the younger group, but younger people have parents and grandparents as well. And so if I think that if uh, people saw an advertisement from Sage in a Pride related material, whether it's a Pride Festival or just regular communication from Pride, mm -hmm. that, that helps spread spread the message, seeing that, you know, <laughs> we're taking the trouble mm -hmm. to put our name forward in a yeah. 2SL GBTQ medium, uh, I think might be helpful. Yes, I know I had attended the, um, one of the events here that was, uh, it was the radio station, uh, and they were talking about, oh, I can't remember what it was called now, but um, I listened to it, CJSR, I think. And yeah, how that was like a good network. That's, yes, that's really helpful. Yeah. I think someone else put their hand up. I yeah. think there, there's other networks um, like the Capital Club or uh, Edmonton Vocal Minority or Team Edmonton. Um, they usually have some kind of websites or, or um uh, sometimes newsletters that go out. Um, I think there's probably links to lots of organizations on the Pride Center uh, website. Um, I think Evan to Pride Seniors Groups probably has some. If if you haven't already tapped into them, I think there are you know exclusively gay organizations out there. And, and I think Eric's so right. I mean, uh, older people always have some kind of younger people in their lives, you know, that the message can get out there. Mm -hmm. Before well, this session, I never, ever thought of uh, elder abuse, ever. It's just, mm -hmm. <laughs> so this has been really uh, informative for me. Oh, that's good to know. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Laura. It's a, a wonderful presentation. And uh, I think... Again, as Jan said, a lot of, you know, sometimes it's also important to let seniors know what abuse is because they may mm -hmm. be experiencing abuse, but not really understanding that this is not right. You know, this is, again, you know, things have changed in their relationship over the last 15 years and suddenly it's a very dangerous relationship, but because it's occurred over a 15 year period or a 20 year period, they may not mm -hmm. say something wrong with this. So always being open. But I'd like to thank you so much for for this. Uh, for everybody who's attending, we are going to be uh, sending out a brief survey. Would really appreciate your comments. In the chat box, uh, Laura has been kind enough to put the, fo the direct phone number for the Sage Safe House and for the CSS Elder Abuse Resources and Supports. Um, and I don't want to talk too long, but one of the great things about Edmonton is these networks like the elder elder abuse or the seniors protection partnership bringing together a lot of different people in the city uh so it's it's really wonderful and i thank you so much for your work um mm -hmm. what i'd like to do is uh just put in a brief plug for next week's session and our speaker next week is very well respected but i can never pronounce his last name properly. So I would ask, Jan, I'll put you on the spot, <laughs> seeing as you know. Um, we're, we're having Kurt Krevinschuk. He's the um, uh, our part artistic director and general manager of Edmonton Vocal Minority. He's going to talk about the Edmonton Vocal Minority Organization, which is the queer choir in Edmonton. So now I saw Laura go, did you not know there was a queer choir organization in Edmonton? No, that's amazing. I, I really want to get like more and more in touch with my community. <laughs> Every so, four years, awesome. there's, there, there's the gay games of choir where all the choirs from across Canada meet in a city and sing for each other, sing for friends, sing for audience members. It's uh, choirs are a really big deal. It's, it's lots of fun. And uh, there's lots of us out there come next week <laughs> yes i'm gonna join next week <laughs> and and i haven't i haven't been to a vocal minority choir uh concert for 
a couple of years now, but my favorite used to be always ending the uh, evening with Dancing Queen, which is the only time that you'll ever hear me sing and dance at the same time. So uh, please, everybody, um, if you would you know, tune in next week, he's a very, very interesting man, has got a lot of insights. And uh, I think singing as a group is something that so many people grew up with uh, various religious institutions, and it's a way of connecting back to the community. Um, Laura, I just want to say thank you so much again for uh, your presentation today. Very, very helpful and uh, getting the message out to the community. We're ending a little bit early, but um, if you would like to uh, stay on for a couple of minutes after everybody else signs off and just give us any feedback that you have for these we'd really appreciate it and to everybody else thank you so much for attending this week really enjoy oh roy are you nope <laughs> okay uh, still a little still a little bit not good at the moderating duties problem here but uh again thank you everybody uh we'll see you I won't be here next week. I'll be in the beautiful downtown Lethbridge, but everybody else, I'm sure you'll enjoy next week's uh, session. Thank you, Laura. Um, and I just wanted to add as well, I'm going to put my... Uh... Oops, you just muted yourself, unfortunately. Push the wrong button. <laughs> um, I'm going to put my direct number in the chat as well. Um, because uh yeah i appreciate the things that you guys said and i yeah understand that like the system as a whole can be very intimidating to uh come out to and to get support from and so if anyone feels a little bit safer with me in particular um even just to ask some questions please feel free to call or text me anytime um i won't answer in the evenings or weekends but uh i'll definitely call you back and yeah, I would love to, if anyone even wants to just give me some more tips, I would really appreciate that. Super, super. Again, thank you so much. Just uh, after this, log, log in again briefly and we'll have a, a brief conversation, see how we can improve. Thanks, everybody. Hope awesome. you come back next week.